All right, good afternoon. Thanks for coming. I'm from a, a US-based firm, uh, Optimum Healthcare IT. And um, we do a lot of staffing for staffing and advisory for EPR installs, vendor selection, ongoing support, and kind of everything in between. So, uh, you know, with the American um, Recovery and Reinvestment Act in 2009, we've really gone through uh, a lot of enterprise EPR implementations in the United States, and we're really transitioning to support. There's still a lot of large scale installs going on but uh, a lot of large integrated delivery systems uh, domestic in the U.S. are transitioning to support right now. And they're seeing that's turning out to be a little more difficult than they anticipated. You know, implementation was always presumed to be a pretty uh, expensive and arduous undertaking, and that's, that's proved to be the case. I think uh, the initial belief was that once you got through implementation, it was pretty much easy going beyond that. And, and now that uh, uh, really pretty much a preponderance of the large integrated delivery networks in the U.S. have gotten past that, they're seeing that's not really the case. And there's really an opportunity there to improve. So we want to talk a little bit about the pitfalls that uh, we're seeing in the U.S. side. I, you know, I'd like to hear a little bit from you to see if that's the case on the U.K. side uh, and, and go from there. So some of the typical EPR challenges we're seeing in the U.S. Uh, are, are it's just turning out to be a lot more expensive than they bargained for. Um, you know, the, the system's installed, it's working, it's functional, that's great. But there is that element of users who are still frustrated, uh, optimization efforts are slowed, some of the routine maintenance slowed. The general definition of the support model really hasn't been socialized and well understood. The support staff is frustrated, you know, people who were either in the course in the throes of the implementation or who came after. Uh, it's just a little bit of a different environment than it was during the implementation. There's a lack of transparency out to the operation about what, what support entails, how much work is out there, what, how it's getting done, and there's a huge reliance on people. The focus is really on the number of horses they have maintaining the system uh, over the processes of, of how they go about having a productive uh, support environment. So some of the in implementation at attributes, uh, you know, why do we say implementation is more difficult. So, you know, for one, it's a capital expense, and I'll kind of compare these to the support model, Oop, butterfingers, to the support model uh, differences. So in implementation, obviously, it's a capital expense. No one's really, uh, everyone appreciates that. The money's already been allocated. It's not pulling from operation budgets. There are really, there are no live users in the system. Um, you know, implementation is really theoretical. There's, there's no one to support. There are clear roles, responsibilities, and direction during the course of implementation. That's really not the case during the support environment. It's a little more chaotic than people expect it's going to be. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's a real strict discipline through the course of implementation. There's project schedules, there's you know, build charts, all these uh, types of tools, project management tools in place. Not so much the case, not a lot of transparency or tools or processes and support. Uh, a big thing is the EPR vendor, those last two bullets, EPR vendors and the uh, contracted, uh, a lot of times implementation partners, are there to support the build. And uh, that kind of lulls you into a sense of a security that, boy, we're really getting through this implementation fairly well. Um, support should be just fine. So it's kind of a false sense of security that we've seen. So, you know, how are the staffing levels determined typically in an organization. And in, in the U.S., a lot of it is the vendor. The vendor advises uh, organizations on, on um, the number of people, the types of people they should have in place. They're, they look to their peer organizations who may or may not be going through an experience similar to theirs. Um, and what we see is, you know, we ask the question, does form follow function or does function follow form? So what we're seeing a lot uh, in the U.S. is that Organizations are predetermining the types of people and the number of people they're going to put into their support environment, but not really thinking about, you know, what is the work we have to have done? What is the type of work we're doing in what quantity? And that's the other, uh, is workload driving the staffing or is staffing driving the workload? A lot of organizations, as they're, as they're coming through implementation and moving to support, you know, if you ask them, what is your workload and what is your workload going to be, that's a fairly open-ended question. There are people who aren't really sure about what that is. So they kind of staff it and hope that the staffing they have can meet the, the workflow uh, or the workload that 
is presented, and if not, they make adjustments after the fact. So turnover is a big problem, and I think a lot of people think the reason for turnover is once, once some of the staff has gotten through an implementation, they're now marketable, they move on to the next organization to make more money, they move on to consulting firms, whatever it might be. What we're seeing is it's more frustration. You know, uh, like I said, implementation is, at the end of the day, the easy part. There are no live users in the system. The, the role, the build they need to do is pretty well defined, um, but that's not so much the case in support. So we kind of look at this as a two-way matrix. You know, after you train your staff up going into implementation, um, when it's done, there, there are two possible outcomes. Did, they, did you retain them or did they leave? One's good, one's bad. The other question is, did they obtain pro proficiency in being able to support that system on behalf of your organization or did they not achieve that after the amount of money you invested in them? So when you look at that on a, you know, a four-way quadrant there, there are four possible outcomes and, and only one of them is good. So another pitfall we see is this it is around capacity planning and expectations management. And you know, putting a real simplistic graphic up there, you know, typically the amount of work we've committed to post live versus the amount of work we're staffed to execute is quite a disparity. And you know, when you see a disparity like this, everyone knows this is the case in healthcare IT. We're being asked to do a lot more than we're staffed to do. But I think what we see when EPR support following implementation, it's not so much that the gap of work that's being done is we're completing this much and not this much, the extent there's a variation between what you've committed to and, and what you're staffed to do. What we're really seeing quite often is the cut is more here, meaning you're 10% of the way done with everything and 100% of the way done with very few, if anything. So the, so the cut really isn't here, where at least you're finishing some amount of the work. The cut is in the other access. So there's some conflicting perceptions is what we see too. Um, you know, I think IT leaders think effort is a, is a measurement of productivity, where obviously the operational leaders think more of output. And, you know, the way we describe this is, you know, I think the IT leaders, the CIO, and some of their staff look within their department, and they see the amount of work being done. You know, they hear hammers banging, and they see sparks flying, and they see sweat dripping off people's foreheads. But the operational leaders are thinking about it and saying, that's all well and good, but is anything really coming off the assembly line? So I think when it comes to productivity, there's a little bit of uh, conflicting perceptions, and a lot of it has to do with this built-in excuse, you know, of, what we've committed to and what we're asked to do far exceeds what we're staffed to do. And by creating that disparity, you've pretty much given the staff the excuse to work a little bit on everything and complete next to nothing. They're working hard as they're asked, they're just not finishing anything. The other one is EPR optimization. I mean, I don't know if is optimization a word they use here in the UK, similar to how they use it in, in the US. Um, we find that to be a misnomer. It's, you know, optimization is a, once you're, once you're installed, it's a, it's a word often described to, okay, we're post live, we have a bolus of work to do to kind of tweak the system. Well, obviously when, when we installed the system, we, no one ever presumes all we're going to do from here on out is do care and feeding. We're going to have new physicians come on. We're going to do new lab tests. But in terms of tweaking workflows, we're never going to do that. Well, that's, that's a false presumption. Obviously, there's going to be you know, service requests. The problem is everybody plans for this bolus of optimization to be done post live, but nobody staffs for that bolus of optimi optimization to be done post live. So really what optimization is, is just one other component of the ongoing support model. It's service requests, service re requests that you're always going to expect to happen. So this is kind of the, the um, symptom, and that's more the disease as a result of that symptom. So some of the support staffing considerations we'd have are to start at the beginning. Uh, start at the very beginning of your EPR planning. We see a lot of organizations waiting. You know, We can plan for support sometime before activation. Maybe it's a month, maybe it's two months. <laughs> the big pitfall we're seeing is they don't start thinking about it until maybe two weeks after they've gone live on their large EPR enterprise go live. 
So starting at the beginning and designing with the end in mind is a critical success factor uh, in our opinion. Um, it saves a lot of money, not just for the implementation phase, but also uh, in the support phase as well. So consult experts. You know, in this case, you know, there are a lot of excellent EPR vendors out there who have great products and great um, uh, advice for how to install the product. But the EPR vendors aren't always the best resource on how to staff a large support continuum for a large enterprise EPR. There are a lot of experts out there that are. We believe that it's more of a science than an art. We see organizations who try to just make it up as they go along, and that uh, really hasn't been a successful approach. And then, you know, really the business we're in and, and some others is uh, engaging in a managed services partnership. You know, when there are a lot of homegrown EMRs, EPRs, it made sense. You know, the organizations needed an army of people to support the, the application that they internally developed themselves. But now that we're buying off the shelf, you know, uh, software applications that uh, most of these vendors have large market shares, why is every healthcare organization standing up their own army of people to support an application that them and so many of their peers own. So relative to managed services, the typical market solutions in the US, I'm a former CIO who uh, in most of my organizations I had Epic or Cerner. There weren't a lot of third parties out there to my surprise who were uh, supporting this uh, uh, as a third party. Not a lot of managed services uh, organizations out there. There are some who marketed themselves as managed service organizations, but what they were really doing is just filling staffing holes. They were doing staff augmentation, filling holes for organizations uh, when they popped up. Some were doing level one service desk. That really wasn't a huge improvement for organizations anyway, but very few were doing actual application support uh, for any of the major vendors. So they were doing that remote staffing and they had people who knew the systems, there just weren't a lot of definition around you know, what the control systems were, what the control mechanisms were, how the managed service uh, organization uh, interacted with their clients. So and I think part of the cause for that is they were largely developed by career consultants. Again, people who knew software very well, but people who didn't know the complexity inside healthcare organizations, the complexities of uh, an IT department in a healthcare organization. So, um, you know, the services are siloed. Like I said, we, we have people doing service desk in the U.S., we have people doing some staff augmentation, but, but nobody had a comprehensive model for how to support enterprise EPR and partner with clients to do that. So what we believe for a managed services and primary is, is to be more than that. So when, when organizations are looking for a third party to help them support their enterprise EPR, um, our advice is to look for more than just staff talent staff talent who happens to be trained or certified or knowledgeable on the platform that uh, your organization possesses. It's more people who can be advisors and have an understanding and can demonstrate a full understanding of the entire support continuum, how the different components of it interact with one, each other, with one another. We, you know, uh, a perfect managed services solution uh, reduces dependencies on the real expensive staff you bring into your organization. It reduces dependencies on the, uh, the help desk as the first and only line of defense, which we know isn't great for clinicians and other end users. Um, and a good managed services solution will, will leverage their rare and expensive talent across multiple organizations. Um, and they allowed for tiered staffing. So m most organizations can't afford to have hundreds of FDEs who subspecialize in the various complex components of, a, of an enterprise EPR system. Rather, they have to have people who have a broad knowledge. And, and early on, that broad, broad knowledge, you know, requiring that broad knowledge and having few number of FDEs to cover the most ground as possible results in a lot of low pro productivity. So a good managed services solution partner is able to have kind of subspecialists in the system that in, uh, uh, a healthcare organization couldn't afford to do, to do and those we can that that talent can be leveraged across multiple clients in order to uh, reduce the cost and increase the the uh, productivity and knowledge, and it really has to be based on process. Anyone who who is coming forth and and, and just talking about their, the number of horses and bringing brute force to the to the uh, table um, it should be viewed with skepticism. I think it's it's people who really understand the process for how how requests for 
whether it's basic routine maintenance or complex service uh, enhancements, uh, are handled within the organization and filtered down to, to the EPR talent. So this is a, you know, a, a, a diagram of, of a staffing solution we believe is best practice. Now, in a lot of organizations, because they can't afford to have you know, hundreds of FTEs uh, who subspecialize in various components of the EPR, a lot of their people are jack of all trades. And you know what they say about jack of all trades, they're, they're really masters of none. So we're, what we believe uh, can happen uh, if you engage a managed services partner, you keep, you know, it's, you start with an understanding of function. What are the functions that need to be executed to enable a, a high functioning support, increase user satisfaction, keep up with the maintenance that needs to be done, is to really reduce the number of people you have in your organization and contract out some of the more basic low cost work to a third party who you believe is capable of, of adopting that. So I think it's really going from a, a traditional uh, model of, of having, again, that, that few people who, who are jack of all trades to, to, to a more contemporary model where there's an appreciation for you know, what boots really need to be on the ground versus um, you know, what can be leveraged through virtually through a managed services partner. So with that said, does anybody have any questions or comments or observations or